Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi. I think we're on. I think we're on. Is anybody out there? I don't see anybody watching. Okay. Oh, there's one person watching. Good. So I turn don't it think towards, I'm us, towards me just a little bit, or, uh, or towards you, I think. Other way. There you go. Good. Okay. Much better. All right. Hi, everybody. All right. Yep. I can see people. Can everybody are. hear us? Amanda says hello. Nancy says hello. And Eric's right. here too. All right. Good. All right. Welcome. Monday. Thanks, Tracy. <laughs> we do too. <laughs> My goal is to put it in a different spot every night. So, or every time. So, tonight you got the fireplace. It's like one of those uh, Christmas movie things where you can like watch the fireplace for. Oh, okay. Hi, Lori. All right. Well, we're excited again uh, to share with you this week a few of uh, our wines. And we've got um, a couple of interesting wines, a brand new wine to us. One that we've had for a long time, and uh, actually two that we've had for a long time. One, the pig pool that we've really liked and enjoyed for a long time. And I'm going to probably not move that there because it looks like my head is balancing on it. <laughs> um, so uh, hopefully everybody got their wines and uh, they've got the sheets. I've got my sheets. I'm going to cheat a little bit if uh, there's some notes that I'm looking for. Um, you see we've got ours laid out here so you can uh, join along, drink with us. You've probably already been drinking. At least I hope you have been. And uh, um, we're going to get started. Although last week, uh, somebody mentioned and wanted to hear a little bit about uh, a little more how to taste. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more how to taste. I'm not going to go in depth. Maybe what I'll do is I'll do a totally separate video and really go in depth on it and just put that on the Facebook page. So if you're interested, you can watch that on your leisure. Um, I know there's a lot of places that you can go for wine education, which is why I hesitate to do a lot on our page because there's so many places and so many things that uh, you can look at. I think if you double click, are you watching live? I am not. I'm oh. just watching comments. So okay. don't, you can ignore me if I'm not looking at the camera. I'm watching all of you and what you're saying. So. Um, so I hesitate to put a lot of educational stuff out there because there's so many places. But I know if you're a fan of vino and you want to uh, see me put out more, you can always ask wine questions. I can answer them uh, video or through posts or through tasting and uh, all sorts of stuff. So I will talk a little bit about tasting. Uh, when I teach tasting, and also somebody asked a little bit about um, kind of why it is or how it is or what, how we've learned. And uh, um, when we started the business, when we got into the business in 2003, uh, over 16 years ago, 16 and a half years ago, uh, I was a total wine novice. I drank beer. I was a beer drinker. And I enjoyed beer, and I still really enjoy beer. And uh, Lorene drank a little bit of wine, not a ton. Um, but we That's because I didn't drink a lot, not because I didn't drink a lot of wine. Right. You didn't drink a lot, but I mean, nowhere near the amount of wine that we drink now. That is true. Not, not only in volume, but more. in breadth and depth and everything else. Yeah. And quality. And so uh, we really jumped in sort of feet first. And I jumped in with the education aspect of it. So really quickly, um, I've taken some formal stuff through a couple of different entities. One being the uh, Society of Wine Educators, where I earned my uh, certified specialist of wine, CSW. And then the other one was through the Wine Spirits Education Trust, where I've uh, gone through and have got my advanced uh, certification in the WSET or WSET Wine Spirits Education Trust, which is a worldwide organization. And so the tasting that I'm going to talk about is kind of the way we go through. It's a systematic tasting. And when I teach it, I always joke that it's all about all of our senses, uh, including our sense of hearing. Uh, because if you are drinking wine with somebody and you hear them say, mmm, that's good, or ooh, that's no good, that's sort of how your sense of hearing comes in. But otherwise, it's really about all of your senses. Your sense of sight, smell, touch, tactile, all of those things come to play with what we think of as flavor and wine and wine tasting. Um, you, I think you heard me say it probably the first week. When you smell wine, you really want to spend a lot of time smelling it because your sense of smell and what we characterize as flavor is 75% uh, olfactory. It's 75% of the nose versus 
um, 25% actually what we taste on the palate and on your tongue. So the first thing you want to do when you start to taste, and this is, um, I'm going to go through this relatively quick, is to see the wine, to look at the wine. So when I'm just going to throw that in uh, a comment in there because Ron said he's going to go through it quickly. He never does anything quickly. So if that's number one, um, when he says quick, it's not going to be that quick. Number two, um, if you really want to get into it with him and you want to hear him, he could talk easily, uh, I'm going to say 15, 20 minutes about how to taste wine. And when we have wine classes through the um, wine university that we do, he does spend that much time on it. So this is going to be, I'm going to prompt him to go quick, <laughs> quickly. So... So I'm going to, actually I'll do it with the white. I'll do it with the red. I'll talk about all of them. So the first thing you want to do is you want to see the wine. So the easiest way to look at a, a glass of wine, the color, um, is to hold it over something light colored, like the tasting sheet over your hand. And you want to do this in a well-lit environment. So we're not in the greatest lit environment, and you probably aren't either. But what you're doing in looking at the wine is looking at the brilliance of the wine. You're looking at the clarity, the color, the depth of color, whether it's super opaque or whether you can see through it. You're looking to see if there's any sediment, if it's cloudy, if it's super cre uh, uh, clear and crystal clear. And that's going to be really important when we hit the middle one, when we hit the Merlot. I'm going to talk about how it's got a cloudy characteristic to it and why that sense when you're looking at the appearance is important. And what that tells you uh, about the wine, something about the wine um, will show you why it's a little bit cloudy. Um, so you want to just look at it. The color is really important. In white wines, the really light, bright character, especially if you look at uh, a Pinot Grigio or a Sauvignon Blanc, they tend to be almost water white, like, like almost clear. And that tells you that the wine is probably not going to have much uh, adulteration going on with it, meaning oak aging. If you compared the pick pool that we've got in our glass to, let's say, a really oak aged Chardonnay, the oak aged Chardonnay is going to get a lot of color, a lot of golden hues. Um, from the oak that imparts it and also part of the oak aging allows for a little oxidation and that oxidation also lends to some of that golden characteristic that you get in that and that's why older white wines tend to go a little bit more towards the golden straw color versus like this is almost green it's almost got a green hue to it with red wines and you'll see them when we compare the two red wines that we have here um, they'll go from a purple color a really purple almost blue hue to more of a, a garnet, a brick red color. And that is strictly a little bit about varietal or the type of wine it is, but a lot and mostly about age. And so when you look at the two red wines we have, we've got a 2014 and 2016. And even in that um, time frame, I think it was 2016, right? Hello. Yeah. Um, even in the two years time frame, you're going to see a dramatic color difference between these two. Now, of course, the Bellicosa is a blend. It's a Bordeaux-style blend. And the Starmont Merlot is 100% Merlot. But you're going to be able to tell the color difference when you hold those two side by side. And that's strictly from age. So visually inspecting, it's going to tell you a little bit about the varietal, a little bit about the age, maybe a little bit about the filtering or the fining, all those things just from looking at it. In fact, you might be able to pick up on a, a wine if it's faulted, uh, based on the lack of that uh, color and that lack of sort of brilliance to the wine, if it's kind of got a dull look to it, that might be the first visual cue, the first cue at all, that something's wrong with it. So after you see the wine, you inspect it for a while, you want to smell the wine or you want to swirl the wine first. Um, if you're really doing a technical analysis of it, you might actually smell the wine before you swirl it. For us, we're just going to swirl the wine. When we swirl the wine, we want to swirl it and uh, really get a lot of air into it. All this is doing is expanding the surface area in the glass so the aromas can evaporate off and collect inside the glass. Um, it's allowing any sort of off odors, uh, maybe from a little sulfur or something that's a little funky from being in the bottle for a long time. It's letting that burn off and uh, sort of evaporate away from, from the wine. Um, when you swirl, uh, this is why I don't pour a really heavy in the glass. You really wanna swirl, give it a lot of air. And once you start doing this, you're going to do this all the time. You're just going to naturally do it. Uh, you see Lorena swirling uh, uh, off the table. Um, if you're comfortable doing that, otherwise it's a great way to do it. And as you swirl, you can continue to examine the color and the clarity and all those good things. So when you're ready, you want to smell the wine. Um, when you smell the wine, don't be shy. Stick your nose right in the glass. You want to stick it so that if you're wearing strong uh, perfume or somebody near you is wearing strong perfume, you want to avoid smelling any of that. Strong food, strong candles, all of those other aromas, 
you want to eliminate and stick your nose right in the glass. So when you do this, my glasses once in a while get in the way, so I take them off. But you want to smell uh, bottom of the glass, like really low in the profile of the glass when you're holding it facing you, up high in the glass, and then um, side to side and all around the opening of the glass because aromas are nothing but molecules, and molecules are different weight, and so they come off the wine and they come and they exit the glass at different points. So every once in a while, you'll smell something very distinct at a very distinct point in the glass. You want to smell it with your mouth open, with your mouth closed. Um, if you're a fan of the movie Sideways, there was one scene where Miles is like holding his ear and like smell like this, like he's a musician and he's trying to, you know, hear himself sing or hear himself smell, whatever. So um, just spend a lot of time smelling the wine. It's really a really important thing about it. And again, it can tell you a lot about other things. The age of the wine, you're going to get different characteristics than you would with a really young wine if it's an older wine. So after you swirl it for a while and you smell it for a while, you want to sip the wine. When you sip it, you want to take enough into your mouth where you can comfortably hold it in your mouth without uh, having um, too much where it's uncomfortable, where you feel like you have to swallow, but heavy enough that if you sort of mouth the wine just a little bit, just sort of kind of chew on the wine. I'm not talking like a mouthwash rinse type movement. I'm talking about just enough so you can coat your entire mouth. Then you want to do that. You want to keep the wine in your mouth. So you're going to start to taste things. You're just going to start to feel some things. And the other thing that happens is your body temperature starts to warm that wine up. And when that happens, more aromas evaporate off into your mouth and collect in the roof of your mouth, which prepares us for the next stage, which is slurping the wine or trilling the wine. In slurping the wine, with the wine still in your mouth, you're going to tip your head slightly forward. And as though you're slurping soup off of a spoon, you want to draw air through your pursed lips um, and sort of like gurgle and like bubble the wine in the front of your mouth. When that happens, the air passes over the wine and takes in all those aromas that are collected from it evaporating in your mouth and uh, draws them up in your retronasal passages and it engages your sense of smell with your sense of taste. That is absolutely critical in enjoying wine. And anybody who drinks wine on a really regular basis, you will always, always, always hear them uh, slurping their wine, trilling their wine. Do that a couple times. Now, cautionary notes. When you do that, two bad things can happen. Number one is, if you have your head tipped a little too forward, you might drool a little bit, dribble a little bit of wine. If you had your, have your head tipped back too far, you might choke on a little bit and cough and aspirate a little bit of wine. Neither is a big deal, but if you've never done this, I implore you, practice, practice, practice. Do this and you will do it every single time you drink wine. It doesn't have to be loud and obnoxious or gross. You'll figure out how to do it uh, calmly and quietly. But it's okay if it is. It's okay if it's gross and loud and If people, slurpy. that's how they want to, yes, yeah. no problem here. Um, and then you'll start to do it out in public. You'll do it at dinner parties. You'll do it all the time. That's just because of the way it is. Um, the next thing you want to do is swallow the wine. When you swallow it, um, swallow it and just think about it and let it linger. Don't go on to the next drink right away. Um, just sort of relax. Think about how the wine finishes off. Two major things happen once you swallow, and this goes to your sense of touch. One is your mouth might water, and you'll get a water, um, a mouth watering sensation. You might get a little bit of zippy, sort of uh, um, almost like a squeeze on your gums, where uh, the acid almost makes it pucker. And that mouth watering and that pucker sensation is from the acid in the wine. High acid wines will really, really do that. If you think about a uh, uh, New Zealand. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Exactly. Practice, practice, practice. Um, New, Zealand, New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs are high acid like that and uh, they'll make your mouth water. The pig pool is going to be a little bit. We're going to talk about that. The other thing that can happen, and we'll probably experience it with the, with the uh, two reds tonight, is your mouth can dry out where you, we've probably all experienced it when all of a sudden you have no uh, saliva in your mouth and you're, it's like dry cotton mouth. Uh, that is from uh, the tannin in the wine, and tannin is a substance found in the skids and the skins and the seeds. And when you have that in your mouth, it binds to the protein in the saliva, and it sucks the saliva out of your mouth, therefore making you have this dry sensation in your mouth. And then the last thing you want to do is you want to savor the wine. And savoring is thinking about what remains, what you're still tasting, what the flavors and the characteristics and everything that's going on 
after you after you swallow. Some wines finish really quick. Some wines will finish uh, over 30 seconds a minute. And generally speaking, what we talk about is uh, those wines that uh, have a lot going on once they finish typically are pretty um, high quality wines. At any rate, so the way it all looks, and I'm going to just do it with the pick pool because that's what I'm going to, we're going to taste right away. And so you can go ahead and taste the pick pool and I'll introduce the wine right away and then we'll sort of do it. I've looked at this wine. It's uh, got a little bit of golden hue to it and certain lights right at the rim, the edge. You might actually get uh, like a greenish hue almost. Um, and that's very normal. Sometimes in Sauvignon Blancs you get that. Uh, so this is the Pick Pool de Panay. Pick Pool is the, you've got the bottle in front of you, but there you go. Uh, Pick Pool is the name of the grape. Um, the, the name of the wine, the Pick Pool de Panay, is the Pick Pool grape from Panay, which is a little uh, village in the south of France. Within, um, it, It's near the town of Pomerals with an S, not to be confused with Pomerol, which is the the region, the great wine growing region in Bordeaux. But Picpool is the grape, and the translation of Picpool is lip stinger, um, or stings the lips. And that's because of that high acid, um, when you, when you uh, drink it, you're going to get that uh, really zippy characteristic. So we're going to swirl the wine, we're going to smell it. Look at that. I just came up as watching. That's funny. You're watching yourself. Apparently. So this is uh, on the nose. It's fresh. It's light. It's bright. I get uh, a little herb. A little herb. So that's really interesting. So within the region where this is grown, um, and you'll hear this if you if you read a lot about French wine, there's a, a Garigou, um, which is a uh, a land that is uh, shrubs. Herbs, uh, there can be actually uh, like herbs like thyme um, and those types of characteristics. And with that, oftentimes the wines, you get the sense that they pick up that characteristic of all that sage and that uh, sagey characteristic. Also a little bit of uh, apricot or peachy. I get the citrus in it. Okay, so I'm going to taste So, when you swallow and you get that mouth-watering sensation, that's the acid in the wine. We had a winemaker one time tell us that if you wanted to see if a uh, wine had acid in it, you take a drink. Okay, don't try this at home. When you swallow, tip your head forward and open your mouth. When you do that, <laughs> you feel like you're gonna drool. you feel like you're going to drool. So I saw uh, Nancy commented that it's salty. So that's really interesting. That's like a mineral characteristic. And uh, um, the area where this is grown is limestone. And it's also very close to the ocean. So in those wine regions, they talk about getting almost a salty mineral uh, characteristic to them. They actually refer to this wine as uh, the Muscadet of the South. And Muscadet is a wine growing region up in the uh, Loire Valley, which is very, very far in France. It's very far to the west. It's very close to the ocean. And those wines tend to have that very salty characteristic. This wine would pair amazing with seafood, with uh, oysters, with... Um, pasta, uh, like a light pasta. Uh, like not uh, like a, like a uh, lemon sauce or a... Uh, yeah, but no, nothing really creamy. Right, like a yeah. lemon sauce or yeah. garlic sauce. A garlic sauce would be good. Yeah. Oysters. Well, how many of us eat oysters at home? I We should start. Where do we even get oysters to eat them at home? So that's why I never say oysters. I know it's If there's somebody to be... out there that can get us oysters for home, hook us up. <laughs> it's supposed to be really great with oysters, and I understand that, but I don't see that we eat that at home. A light fish? Yeah, so that limestone soil really comes through in that 
mineral characteristic of the wine. Um, so uh, what do you think of this wine? And I ask because I think this wine has always been like a super uh, go-to uh, white summer wine for me. Uh, that high acid. I mean, every, it's really easy to do a uh, Pinot Grigio or really easy to do a uh, Sauvignon Blanc. But if you can grab something unique, something different, um, yeah, this is just a, yeah, exactly, Kelly. It's total porch ponder. Mm -hmm. um, that means, that's not an unofficial term. That's a term that many people use and we use too. It just means it'd be really great on a hot summer night or warm summer night, sitting out on your deck, um, sitting in, on your porch. Rehydrating, yeah, yeah, as it were. So let me see if there's some other things that I want to talk about off the tasting sheet. Um, Within the uh, tasting notes down on the bottom, it talks about the vinification. It says there's no malolactic fermentation. So malolactic fermentation, as you may recall from, if you uh, heard me talk about it at the first tasting, is a uh, bacterial fermentation that goes on with the acid in wine. And it changes malic acid to lactic acid. Malic acid is sharp acid, sharp apple-like acid. Lactic acid is round, soft milk acid. And there's no malolactic, or for short they say ML, there's no malolactic in here, which is why it's still got that crisp acidity to it. A lot of Chardonnays will go through some partial or maybe all uh, malolactic, and that's what gives them those round, buttery characteristics from the dicetyl that's generated as a result of that, which gives you butterscotchy and uh, dairy characteristics. So, um, good so Yeah. So I think that's about it. Unless anybody has any questions about this wine. Um, so the wine itself is actually, I'll tell you a little bit about the background of the wine. The wine itself, it's from France and it's, um, we get it through our uh, distributor, but they get it through an importer, uh, um, Casella Parrot Fills. And Casella is uh, owned, operated by a gentleman named Fran Casella. And Fran Casella, who we've met, we've traveled with, uh, his portfolio is really focused on super value wines, like a ton of wines. Most of the wines in the whole portfolio are under $20 retail. And he just chooses wines that uh, over deliver for the price, you know? So when you taste this wine, you think this is, you know, maybe a, a 19, 20, $22 wine, and it over delivers in my opinion. And that's what his whole portfolio is. Fran has been in the wine industry for years and years and years. He was, he's actually a master Psalm. He was the on 12th person, 12th person in the United States to get their Master of Psalm certification. He's halfway to his uh, Master of Wine. Um, I don't know if he'll ever do it. I know that he likes to drink, travel, eat, hunt, and do a lot of other stuff. But uh, um, great wines. We've got a bunch of them from the, from the portfolio and uh, really, really enjoy his wines. And his wines, meaning the wines that he imports. And he, this one's actually worked with a cooperative. So those up on top, you see that... Uh, the Cov uh, Cooperative. So in a lot of old world winemaking regions, they don't have like somebody who owns the winery or owns the vineyard. They have farmers who may own their own property and they all harvest the grapes and they bring them to a collective um, and a cooperative like an old farm co-op where then those wines are produced. And uh, Fran works with the, the, the producers, the growers, and uh, this is sort of the wine that he negotiates is kind of the characteristic of what he does. So, are we ready to move on? Yep. It's really good. Yep. It's getting better. Um, ours is a little bit cold. When this wine warm, warms up, just like most wines, when they warm up, they tend to be a little bit more expressive. They kind of open up and give you a little bit more. So, nice wine. All right, so we're gonna move on to, uh, actually just for the trivia people out there, I'm gonna mention this. <clears throat> um, if you read this, there's a word in here that uh, we're not familiar with, but hectar. Hectar is a, uh, it's like an acre to us. They just do everything in hectares in France, just like the metric system. So it's a hectare, and it's actually, uh, hectare is a, um, 100 meters by 100 meters, so it's a specific designated plot of land. 
and it's equal to 2.47 acres. So if you ever read anything in its number of hectares, multiply it by about 2.5, and that's the number of acres for the amount of property. So, all right, let's go on to the second line. Anything we gotta talk about? Nope, people are just talking about food. But Are they making me hungry? Uh, probably, oh. they're making me hungry, and we yeah. haven't eaten yet. We're gonna eat, you know what we're gonna have tonight? Pizza. Yes. I love pizza. I love our pizza. That's what we're having. It's That's our what pizza. we're having. We're having pizza. Um, and pizza's going to go good with, uh, well, probably the last two lines. It's going to go really well. Yeah. What, uh, which one did you bring home? Um, the prosciutto and arugula one. But we are, are having issues getting arugula at the shop, so it's just prosciutto. If you haven't noticed, there's some weird shit going on. <laughs> Not yeah. just. Um, yeah. Yeah. All over the place. We're having troubles getting food. We can't go out in public. That's a little weird. But we can drink. Um, all right, so we're going to go on to the, the Merlot. So a couple things I want you to notice with this. When you look at this wine, the color of it, uh, the color is a little brick red. It's a little garnet color. It's a little bit um, burnt orange kind of right, uh, right on the edge. The other thing that starts to happen is when you look at the wine, you look down at the wine, and you kind of kind of a picture like the oval of the color. Um, in the deepest part of it is, you know, where you're going to see that color concentration. But as it thins out towards the edge, you'll see that color variation. And that's where you're really going to notice the way the color changes within the wines. The other thing that you start to see is there's almost like a clear ring around the outside. That's typically where you'll start to see the alcohol sort of like stand out and the color thin out because color is all about the pigment that comes from the skins of the grapes. And as uh, wine ages, there that pigment starts to um, coalesce and sort of bind to itself and it'll start to fall out. The tannin and the pigment start to fall out. And that's actually what creates sediment in wine, is that stuff coalescing and dropping out of the wine. And with this one, uh, if we looked at the bottle, there might be more sediment in it. And that's because if you look at the description down in the winemaking section here, it says that it was aged for uh, 20 months in 11% new French oak, and then racked a tank to finish and bottled unfined. So without going two off the rails. There's two processes that you'll often hear about. Uh, one is fining, one is filtering. There are two separate processes. Filtering is where they actually run the wine through a filter material and they remove larger sediment. Um, and when I say sediment, I'm not saying stuff you're gonna see. I'm saying it takes out some tannins, some other stuff, um, takes out yeast, the dead yeast cells. Uh, all of that stuff is, um, removed through uh, filtration and there's uh, there's different ways of doing filtration too the next thing is fining and fining is done by adding something to the wine that as it floats through the wine it binds to material and pulls it out um, so that can be uh, biological stuff um, some there's an enzymatic uh, reaction that happens uh, some of the tannin can bind to it and that pulls stuff out. Now, there's a bunch of different fining agents I'm not going to talk about, other, one, other than the fact that one of them is actually uh, swim bladders of uh, fish. And I always <laughs> like to say that because it grosses people out. Yeah. Um, and then if you're, if you're a true vegan, sometimes it's important to know what uh, is used for a fining agent because sometimes it's animal product. If it's organic, it's an animal product, which is the uh, Isson glass or the, the swim bladder or egg whites, things like that. Other things are like an earth material can be. Um, so when you look at this wine, you may notice that it has a little bit of a hazy characteristic to it, just a little bit of a haze. And wines that are unfiltered and unfined will often have that hazy look to them. So again, when you look at the wine, you might sense that there's something weird going on with the wine because of that hazy character to it. But then you want to read the description and figure out um, if it's unfiltered or unfined. And this one's unfined. So I know everybody's already drinking, so I'm talking. You're talking. Speaking so what are you smelling? Oh, I can smell the age, like I said. I already typed that because you're behind. I think it smells like it's got some age on it. I also get a little... And uh, what is that? Describe that characteristics. I mean, you say it smells old, but I mean... I said age. I didn't say old. Okay. Um, a little raisinated or um, like raisin or uh, pruney. 
a little bit of that. Um, mm -hmm. I also get herbal, like uh, I said, maybe rosemary, okay. basil. I'm not quite sure what I'm getting. Okay. But I don't get the big old fruit bomb, like uh, blackberries or raspberries. I, there's a little bit of raspberry in there, but it's, that's not what's all there. There's a little bit more tertiary characteristics. And when you say tertiary, you mean what? You can describe what that means. <laughs> I mean, the, the characteristics that start developing after an age uh, or after a wine has gotten some age on it. And some people like tertiary. I do not like tertiary characteristics. I actually prefer, as I think I've talked about many times, my wine young. Because um, I think once it starts getting tertiary, I miss the fruit. Even though I don't like huge, just only fruit bombs, I miss the fruit when wine starts getting a little older. And of course, I always compare Lorene. Uh, she likes her wine the, likes, the way she likes her men. Young, big, and fruity. That's not true. Clearly, that's not true. Well, you're stuck with me, so. By choice. And the same thing on the palate. I actually get a little um, saltiness on this too. Not quite the same way I got it in the um, the pick pool. More of a um, savory. And again, maybe that's that going back to that herbal. But I get a little savory something in here meaty maybe um it could be meat not quite bacon not not like that but maybe more of a summer sausage but not quite so strong so starmont is a winery so this is grown in the carnaros region of uh, napa sonoma so you've heard me talk about avas american viticultural areas and uh avas is a legally defined region that is uh set apart from its surrounding regions by things like climate soil um, specific weather, altitude, all those different things go into defining an AVA. And this is in Carneros AVA. Carneros, if you looked at a map of California and you know where San Francisco is and you've got the San Francisco Bay Area and then sort of the spur of the bay that goes up north is the San Pablo Bay. Carneros sits right north of the San Pablo Bay. And when you're in the Carneros region, you can look south and you can see the bay relatively flat. Um, and it spans, the Carneros region is actually located in Sonoma and in Napa. And those are two county AVAs. So Sonoma County, uh, Napa County are two uh, county level designated um, wine regions. And so this one sits down there. And uh, Merlot generally um, is, you know, with a lot of ripe fruit and all sorts of stuff. It's an early ripening grape. With that early ripening, it... it uh, um, sets early in the spring, it also uh, ripens early. And curiously, the soils in this area are uh, very clay, um, poorly drained, so the water sort of sits around. And it's a cooler climate, and you can kind of get a hint of that. If you look down at the alcohol percentage, it's 13.8%. 13.8% for a, uh, a California big red wine is pretty low. When we get to the, the next one, we're gonna be up in the mid 14s. The thing that's interesting about that, when you start to know wines and you think about wines as a global thing and the regions, if you looked at Bordeaux, Bordeaux, France, where um, Merlot on the right bank or the north of one of the primary rivers that comes in, where that Merlot is, Merlot is sort of king, um, and that's where Pomerol, not Pomerols, where the uh, pig pool is from, but Pomerol, as a region, is all a lot of clay soil. And they grow fabulous, incredible, one of the most expensive uh, wines in the world, uh, Chateau Petrus, is um, uh, Merlot and Cab Franc, generally speaking, but it's grown there. And France is cooler climate. So this is, to me, sort of uh, French wine grown in California, sort of made in the French style. It's not big fruit. It's got some secondary stuff. It's got some character from the oak. Um, it's um, new oak. It's only 11% new oak, so not a lot, but. So Melissa, I just uh, read your comment and completely agree. It has um, changed in even the, the, what is it, four minutes? I'm looking at the clock. Four minutes, uh, it's already um, becoming a little bit more my palate. Not quite just, uh, the old characteristics of the tertiaries, but more fruit, more more rounded, more complex, and not so singular as what I was getting before. It was, it was just a little too singular for me. 
I'm getting so the tannins. So remember I talked about tannins. These are starting to round out a lot. So some tannins, really young tannins in a big wine can be sharp or coarse or rough. I think these are starting to round out and they're still there. It's still pretty present, which to me tells me that uh, this wine's going to age. It can age for another three to five years probably pretty easily. There's still good acid to get a little mouthwater, um, but the tannins are still there. But I'm getting like a leather characteristic. And that's where that age kind of shows through. When I swallow, a little leather. Mark thinks it's tobacco. Yeah, I can see yep. that. Tobacco. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all that stuff. And that's all of those tertiary or secondary characteristics that come from, and almost like the, um, come from the aging. So there's three primary categories of aromas. You've got the aromas of the fruit. You've got aromas of the winemaking, which is, the fermentation, the malolactic fermentation, um, the the oak itself, and then you've got the characteristics that develop within the barrel or within the age or within the bottle as that wine ages. And those are sort of that, that third class that really don't come out until you age a wine for any period of time. We should move on. I know. I'm going to see if I got anything else I should talk about. Oh, this. I, I found this when I was doing research. I thought this was... So remember on uh, Windows XP on the operating system, the um, the wallpaper, the generic wallpaper that comes from the factory with the rolling green hills and then the blue sky. Mm -hmm. Remember that? That was taken in uh, Carneros. Oh, that's really funny. That is really. Funny. And of course now that uh, vineyards were torn out, they took the picture, they used it for Windows XP as the generic from the factory wallpaper and now it's all planted to grapes so you wouldn't recognize it but I thought that was I thought that was really interesting that's funny yeah yes trivia question super so for yeah. all you trivia fans uh, this wine scored 90 points from the wine yes. enthusiast uh, um, wine enthusiast 90 points and on Vivino so some of you may be on Vivino I know that uh, for a fact that several of you on here are on Vivino Vivino is an app for uh, iOS I'm sure Android um, where it's a user populated base of user ratings. If you are interested to do it, uh, look up Vivino, create an account. You can start to rate your wines. You can scan a wine label and it finds it and it can tell you what it is. And in today's day and age of like customer reviews, it's a great way to sort of get an idea of how wines are by the drinking public, not just by the wine industry people who may taste thousands and thousands of wines and they have their own preconceived notion of what they like and what they want. Um, but you can go on Vivino, and this one on Vivino, 477 reviews, got 3.9 stars. And to me, it's a four-star rating, so four stars is like 90 points, right? Uh, if you sort of gauge it that way. Um, we look at Vivino quite a bit. Um, I try to rate Vivino. You can look me up on Vivino. You can follow me. I used to be ranked a little bit on Vivino. I'm not really anymore because I'm not active enough on it. But I do want to say, kind of going back to a little bit what um, Melissa said earlier and kind of what I was talking about, is give this wine another 15 minutes um, when we're done and come back to it. I imagine it's going to be even better. So my apologies for the beginning when I was like, oh, I'm not sure about this wine. It wasn't quite my favorite. I think it's uh, going to be better than I originally said. So my mistake. So moving on. So the other thing. We should um, move on. I know we will. <laughs> the other thing about the, the region where this is grown Carneros is the coolest AVA within Napa and Sonoma because it's so close to the ocean and you get those ocean breezes and ocean influences. You get a lot of fog that rolls in and then at night all that cool air and the cool uh, breezes from the ocean uh, blow in. And so what you get is a, a really big diurnal day to night temperature swing which really adds character to the wine. And they always say that between Carneros in the far south of Napa Valley and Calistoga all the way up at the north, there can sometimes be like a 30 degree temperature difference, which is enormous when you're talking, I mean, Napa Valley is only five miles wide, like 30 miles long. So in that 30 miles, you can have just a tremendous difference in temperature. So down on Carneros, they grow Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, and then you get these off sort of uh, um, Bordeaux varietals where they're making them lower alcohol, um, not big fruit bombs. 100% Merlot. Nice wine. It's got, it's aged really well. Yeah. Well, it's not even that old. 
I it's know. only six years old. Well, and it's only been in the bottle probably what? Well, it was, age, it was aged for uh, 20 months, almost two years. And yeah, barely. so it's really not that old. No. So that's why I, I, I retract all my statements about age. And uh, if um, if you are a, uh, a movie buff and you've watched uh, Sideways, you know they really bash Merlot, which is just foolish and stupid, and it uh, crushed the Merlot business in the world, and it exalted Pinot Noir to the point that everybody wanted to make Pinot Noir, and the markets were flooded with not so good Pinot Noir. Yeah. So. Anyway. Move on. Move on. I'm being hastened along. He is. So the next wine. Okay, next wine is the 2016 Bellicosa uh, North Coast Cabernet Sauvignon. So you've got the tech sheet. Uh, I'll throw this out there. And this is this is where, you know, I talked about Vivino, and this is where I said that sometimes it's a better user database, like a user-friendly, what, what do the people think of the wine? This wine got 87 points from wine enthusiasts. 87 points, where the Merlot got 90 points. Um, but on Vivino, it got four stars, 937 ratings. So this one rated higher on Vivino with almost twice as many, actually about twice as many, um, and uh, ratings and four stars. So here's the thing is that uh, um, Vivino tells us what the masses think of wines, where ratings tell us what one super educated, super experienced person believes of the wine. And uh, so just realize it got 87 points from wine through this and it got 84 points from wine spectator and 84 points is great. I mean, I, all through school, I was not much more than a, a C plus B minus B student. So hell 84, I'd take 84 every day, all the time. And then I'd have more beer. Anyway. All right, so this is a blend. This is a blend of 88% Cabernet, 6% Merlot, 3% Petit Verdot, 3% Cabernet Franc. So what that tells us is that it is a Bordeaux-style blend because in Bordeaux, there's only five grapes that can go into a red uh, Bordeaux. It has to be a blend of two or more of the five. So this is a Bordeaux-style wine. North Coast Appalachian is a, a generic overall large Appalachian that contains areas uh, and sort of consists of six different counties. That being uh, Marin, Napa, Sonoma, Mendocino, and Lake County. Those five counties, uh, grapes from all of those regions can go into a wine labeled from the North Coast uh, AVA. The reason that's important is that if you produce a wine, even on a uh, um, Sonoma County designated wine or a Napa County designated wine or a Lake County or any of the counties, for a county designated wine, you have to have 75% of the grapes that go into the bottle have to be from that county. If you designate something like a uh, um, the Merlot from Carneros, 85% of the grapes that are in this bottle have to be from that AVA. So this allows a producer to grab grapes from all over the place where they may not own vineyards. They grab grapes from all over the place from all their connections and they bring them together and they make wine. And this wine is exactly that. So. Uh, in 2015, a gentleman named Daniel Cohen uh, founded Bellicosa. So Daniel Cohen came from came from a wine life. Uh, his father uh, started um, B. R. Cohen. So if you are familiar with B. R. Cohen wines, this is the son. A little trivia for the music bus: B. R. Cohen Winery was founded in 1974 by. Bruce Cohn. So if anybody knows who Bruce Cohn is without Google uh, or Siri or the other woman in our lives whose name I cannot say. We can't say because she'll no, respond to right us. right there. She's like watching and listening. Um, so if you know who Bruce Cohn is, um, shout it out because he, uh, he was in the music business for 40 plus years. Probably still is. But he started B.R. Cohn. 2015 sold B.R. Cohn to focus on his music stuff. Um, and then uh, his son, totally inundated in the wine world, um, started this wine. So what do you think of it? It's meaty. 
It's savory. It's definitely meaty. It's much more meaty than the uh, the Starmont was. That's the primary character. So when you say meaty, explain what you mean. Because you get um, meaty a lot. I do. It, it smells like meat. Meaty. So, but not like raw meat. Um, almost, sometimes it does, but not in this time. Almost sausage. Sausagey. And I said sausage also on the Starmont, but that I said not quite. That burned this, off a little bit. Yeah, it did. So this is um, more savory. It just makes me think of um, steak. It makes me think of eating... Um, Big old, I like my, my steak medium rare. Big old juicy, yeah. But with some pepper and some spices on it. Oh, there's definitely some of that going on too. This is almost like uh, so much alcohol. All right. Who said that? Uh, I'm going to look. Um, so, curiously, let's talk about alcohol for a minute. You see that this one is 14.38. Uh, it was Barb. 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 Winner said she likes or she gets a lot of alcohol yeah i'm a huffer I yeah like it's my... a little hot uh the aroma is a little hot i don't know i haven't tasted it yet, so i don't know if it's really heat yet oh you get smoky kelly i see that thanks kara um so uh i think when loreen says meat and what i get off of this is summer sausage so you know when you cut a piece of summer sausage and it's got the spice and stuff mixed into it and you smell that? That's what you get out of here. You almost you can almost smell like the fatty characteristic of it. There's also a lot of fruit. There's a lot of fruit. A lot of fruit. A lot of fruit. It's, it's young. A, it's very young. So wines like this, uh, oftentimes when I'll taste them, I'll, I'll say it smells purple. And I know colors, unless you're dropping acid, Colors don't have smells. And hopefully none of us are doing that. Well, no. I, we're, I don't judge. Um, so when I say it smells purple, when I opened this first up and it hadn't been open at all, I smelled like uh, jam, like grape jelly, like jam, like almost not preserves per se, but just a lot of grape uh, aromas. This one smells... Like fuzzy purple. I think the fuzzy purpleness is gone. I think now I'm getting just the more meaty, savory. Um, fuzzy purple, like the velour carpet and the roof of my van. What? We don't have a van. I don't have a van. I think it tastes a little purple. I think it tastes more purple than it, than it smells. But it's still got... Um, it's got enough acid that my mouth is watering. It's mega like, purple, yeah. Kelly, mega purple mega from last purple. week, right? Yeah. So I suspect probably not, actually. I suspect it's probably not mega purple. I, I don't think so either. Say that based on price point. So this one retails, I think, for $24.99. Um, and also, um, Daniel Cohen's history in the wine world, sure, he could be doing some like the sons of other really, really famous winemakers are doing. Uh, he could be doing Mega Purple, but I don't get that characteristic out of no, it. I, I get don't super either. young, uh, ageable. And Barb, I think that's normal to for some of the alcohol to burn off, kind of the way I think sulfur burns off and it, as it just opens and as you swirl it, which is why we're sitting here, you know, swirling our wine, it just becomes um, more integrated. And I think that's when the alcohol burns off, you just get more of that integration. All right, so let's see what's some other stuff about here. Um, anybody figure out who uh, Bruce Cohen is yet? We had somebody down by the river. Kelly said Moody Blues. I don't know what that means. Close. Close. Not the Moody Blues, but close. Oh, nice job, Cal. Ah, Finley, that is. We got a couple of you on here. So... Let's look at the tasting notes. So this wine was aged in 100% French oak, 50% of which was uh, new oak. Um, Melissa cheated. Yes, <laughs> give your brothers. Yeah, I'm not surprised, Melissa. I know. But hey, we all had to know. So, so uh, uh, Bruce Cohn managed the Doobie Brothers for like 40 some odd years. Uh, so... 
Um, super, super long history in uh, the wine world and the Doobie Brothers, who he met out there. Doobie Brothers were notorious. They played private concerts for the Hells Angels and motorcycle clubs. And um, they're actually named by uh, uh, like a roommate or a neighbor of them who said, you know, you guys smoke a lot of weed. You should name yourselves the Doobie Brothers. And nobody thought it would stick. And lo and behold, that's how it stuck. So. That's a terrible. Not back in 1970. 72, I think, or whatever, when the Doobie Brothers formed. Yes. All right. Um, so French oak for 13 months. Only 50% new. Newer oak imparts more oak characteristics than aged oak. Uh, French oak imparts less character than American oak. So with this, you're not getting a ton of oak influence off of this wine. So, that purple, I think that's from the Petit Verdot. Petit, Petit Verdot can really stand out sometimes as a really pretty tannic. Um, somebody says, go back to the Merlot. I'm going to try it, Cal. So, this is a beautiful thing. If you still got Merlot in your glass or in your bottle, <laughs> go back, look at the two of them together, look at the color variants, go back and taste back and forth. And you'll see how things change and highlight. And this is why we taste in this order. I didn't want to taste the Merlot first because I was afraid with that age that um, it was going to uh, perhaps get overpowered by the younger, bigger Cabernet, Cabernet blend. Um, so that's why I tasted the Merlot first. So Elaine, I would say, or maybe on a nice crisp spring evening. So before we get done, and we're going to be done in uh, shortly, next week's wines. Um, so one of the things that, you know, is going on is we're having issues <laughs> here in the world. We're having issues. And, um, and here in yeah. my head, I'm having and issues. And so um, we are having issues getting wine. We tried ordering some and we couldn't get it in. Um, so that's one thing we're having, we had some problems with. So we had to kind of, next week, we had to pick wines that we have because we couldn't get what we wanted to get in. So we have three wines picked out for next week. And then the following week, we have the wines that was supposed to be for next week ready. So next week, we're doing red, white, and pink. We're doing red, white, and pink um, with a very simple Chardonnay, which is a simple Chardonnay. A Hey Rosé, look at this bottle. Now, isn't that the super cutest bottle Superhero. That's what we all are, ladies, these days. We're superheroes. And then uh, the Pepper Jack uh, Red Blend. Barossa Red Blend. And like I said, these are all bottles that we had in the shop, so we had to pick something that we could get in for next week. The following week, I do want to talk about that too, because the following week we're doing Pacific Northwest at a request of um, one of our customers. Thanks, Mark. And uh, we're doing... Um, they're written right there, but your notes are on top of my notes, so I can't see We're it. doing a uh, Pinot Gris, Firestead Pinot Gris, uh, Boomtown Syrah. Boomtown is a great wine uh, made by the guys from Dusted Valley, Dusted Valley, uh, out in Walla Walla. Um, the four people who run it, there's two couples. They're all from Wisconsin. Actually, uh, um, Corey's from uh, Marathon City, and Chad is from Chippewa Falls. So we're going to be tasting their Boomtown line. And we carry their uh, stuff in the, in the shop once in a while, too. And then we're doing the Ken Wright Pinot Noir. And uh, Ken Wright, we've poured it on tap at Wausau for a long time. Tap wine, for real. We have that, for those who haven't been in the shop. And uh, we've also personally been out and we visited uh, Ken and uh, tasted with him. We actually sorted grapes with him. My sister and brother-in-law live out in Vancouver, Washington, and they go down and taste and drink and buy from Ken like all the time. Um, so we're doing a Pinot Gris. I was just, I said Pinot Grigio, but that's sort of incorrect. Right. Pinot Gris, Pinot Grigio, same grape. In the Pacific Northwest, they say Pinot Gris. Um, and then we're doing a uh, Pinot Noir, and then we're doing a Syrah. So those are the three ones for that week. And we almost have... 
the following week, which is, I'm looking at my notes, April 27th. We've got some of those um, in route by the by Friday. We'll have those picked out too. So we'll have the next three weeks because my, my understanding is we're going to be in this together for at least the next three weeks. So and we're we going to need to be, a drink. Yes, we hope to be there with you. So Yeah. Gotcha, Kira. We'll, we'll be there for you. <laughs> the Chardonnay next week is the Lindemann's Chardonnay. A simple chard. Actually, $8.99. Um, it's from South Africa. And uh, so when we, were look, when we looked to do these tastings, I mean, just the way our brains think, we want to, I mean, if, if anybody wants us to do like a 50 and above tasting, <laughs> rock on. That's Ron's kind of tasting. Yeah, yeah. But we, we, we try to... Um, or I can throw like a wild card in and we can do like a super high end one if somebody wants, that'd be, but, uh, we look for really value wines. And for those of you who don't know, and I'm going to run long a little bit, but uh, for those of you who don't know, we taste like 90% or better of the wines that show up in the shop. So reps, in fact, we just, uh, rep sent us a full case of wine. We taste through them systematically. We take notes, we look at them and we look basically to make sure that the wine is going to represent at the price point, for the style, for the region, for um, all sorts of stuff. All of those things go into our decision to put the wine on the shelf. So we're doing a uh, Lindemann's Chardonnay from South Africa. That's nine bucks a bottle on the shelf. And it drinks uh, above nine dollars. I'm not saying it drinks like a fifty dollar bottle of Chard, but it's a nice wine. It's got good acidity it's got good flavor good all those things the hay rosé is a, a rosé of malbec and uh we're coming on to spring rosés if you don't drink rosés you have to start rosés have yes. a lot of red wine characteristic you drink them chilled they're fabulous food wines all sorts of stuff and then we're gonna obviously do a, a red and this is a, a a red blend from australia and we'll talk all about those things um yeah so, any other requests? Any other questions? Somebody have something before I go and eat pizza? And uh, South Africa, yay to South Africa. We went to South Africa a couple of years ago. My favorite trip of all time. And if, so, so, uh, so Barb, uh, love South Africa. Your, uh, yeah. it looks like uh, it's a good place to be trapped. And I know that. Um, uh, oh, she's at home. Sorry. Yeah, so um, the th just because we're all in this real weird quagmire, and we went to South Africa and we spent time with some of the uh, the wine folks in uh, uh, South Africa, beautiful country, um, very interesting history. But right now, South Africa is becoming like the worst uh, area for COVID. Hmm. Um, they are not financially set up for it. So if you're into South Africa, it's a heartbreaking thing because they're going to really, really, really suffer from this world pandemic. So I'll get off my news weirdness. But um. So for next week, we have next week's. So they'll be available tomorrow afternoon. Um, the following week are the ones that we're waiting to come in. And they were supposed to be for next week, but they won't be. So those who want to try, we've had people say, can you pick up all three weeks? Yes, by Saturday, fingers crossed, uh, we'll have the next three weeks worth of wines available. So, uh, um, the other weird shop, uh, corn news? wine. Yes, Amanda, agree with you on that. Yes, absolutely, corn wine. Um, the other thing we're doing at the shops because we're here and we're talking to you um, is tomorrow we are starting in-house delivery. Uh, it's not going to be available all the time. It's going to be available from like 11 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. and from like 4 to 6 p.m. And we'll be able to deliver food to you in-house. We have uh, some issues with our delivery services um, where they've been a little bit sort of uh, um, iffy, sketchy, whatever. So we're going to try to do it ourselves. And by the way, there is... Yes, uh, Bart. You just um, uh, you just stole Ron's thunder, Bart. You you, you uh, ring me up and I'll drive the three and a half hours to. Deliver. There is uh, legislation. Oh yeah. Pending right now that we might be able to deliver wine. So stand by, we're watching it very closely right now. You can't; it's illegal. Yes, Kira, to your house. Uh, that's the legislation that's that's pending. Right now, we can't legally deliver wine. Nobody can. But there's uh, um, hopefully there's a push to allow it during this weirdness. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. 
All right, so we're over time. Yes, these Lisa. Are, these are getting... Uh, They're getting longer and longer. Rab talks too much, like I said. So, cheers. You talked as much or more tonight. I, thank you all for supporting us. Thank you very much Sports. for supporting us, for coming out and tasting yes. with us. Um, this is going to continue to go on and on and on and on. And um, uh, in addition, we will probably at some point in time, even after this weirdness uh, stops, continue to do so. We've suddenly got some fans that uh, live quite a bit south, and uh, we got to keep meeting up with them. And uh, I also had one of my other uh, Facebook friends um, uh, who drinks a considerable amount of whiskey. I know there's a couple people on here. They've suggested doing a, a whiskey tasting. And uh, if we did that, we probably wouldn't do three. Although, yep. yeah. Um, so. But, and uh, we can taste wine. If you have questions, you can send them. He's going them long some, again, so. Send them to the shop, all sorts of stuff. Well, people are engaged. They're, people they're are talking. engaged. They if want you want to keep stuff. talking, we'll keep talking to you. So. <laughs> can you start the pizza? <laughs> I can start the pizza. So. If she starts the pizza, I'll just sit here and drink and talk all night. Anyway. Thanks, Lisa. Looking forward to seeing you in person, too. Did you break? Nothing. Okay. Um, so anyway, we have a great time doing these. We, we as you can tell, we uh, uh, taste all the time together. We have a lot of you that are watching us right now that we taste with a lot and we drink with a lot. We have a lot of people who are on here who are uh, some of our reps, uh, some of our you know distributor reps. Um, um, they know wine very well. They could sit here and do this. And uh, I wish we could, we should like do a Zoom one where you can get like 50 people on Zoom and do this because everybody could like uh, talk all about their wines. But we really appreciate it. We uh, appreciate you guys showing up, supporting us. And um, yeah, thanks for coming out. And we're going to see you again uh, cool. next week. And Kelly, if you want, just FaceTime me. We can drink all night together. Anyway, you can push the finish. Cheers. See you next week.